Welcome to episode number 29 of the Better With Brock podcast. I'm here with uh, Jacqueline Orwell. Thank you very much for coming over to the North for this podcast. Uh, Brock, I'm glad we finally made it happen. I feel like there's been a few mishaps along the way, but <laughs> yeah. we are here. Finally, yeah. yeah. So, so we tried to make this happen last year. Yes. Um, and then I got gastro and... Then was, my family got enough. gastro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a tic-tac-toe. Yeah, so we're finally here. Yeah. And just in the nick of time, I got a baby coming on the way in a few days. So, so exciting. So, yeah, this is... Uh, I think I'll take maybe one or two weeks off a podcast on the back. We'll see how we go. Oh, right, very deserved, I think. Yeah. Uh, you won't have a scream, but you might want to just soak in all those beautiful little newborn cuddles for as yeah. much time as you possibly can. Yeah, we're super pumped. So yeah. we got... Yeah, we're 17th is is when it's meant to happen. So, so yeah. Capricorn. Yeah, yeah. And I just had, so I'm a Capricorn as well. Ah, okay. So you know the personality types. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you believe I in that? I don't. Do okay. Um, I know the horoscopes. I know some components of different horoscopes. Yeah. Um, I know that Capricorns can be strong in their mindset. Would that be a true yeah. reflection of yourself? I think so. Yeah. 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 Very much so, actually. Yeah. yeah. And that's not a negative. It can be used in lots of different ways, great yeah. ways. Yeah. I've always read horoscopes out of curiosity because yeah. I don't necessarily believe in them. Yeah. Or believe that just because you're born at a certain time of the year, you will be this sort of person. But also, I've never read a horoscope that I have never agreed with. Yeah. But then I think sometimes they're so general. Yeah. <laughs> at, like at, at the same time. That yeah, it's, it's true. It could be for anyone. Well, at look. At least you've got a January baby. They're going mm-hmm. to be born when most people are on holidays. So yeah. their parties are going to be great yeah. in the years to come because people will be out ready for celebration. Yeah. So there's lots of great things about January babies. Yeah. No, At least I'm it wasn't December 31, January yeah. 1. Well, that's my birthday, December 31. What? Yeah. December. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I say, At least it's not this. You're like, well, that's mine. No, no, no. But I, <laughs> I totally agree because... Um, so personally, I like it because... Yeah. I don't like a big deal about my birthday. Okay. So when I was growing up, we were always traveling yeah. and I was having them in fun times. Like awesome. In New Zealand, we would get in the car, go for a drive and like be in these cool places. Like yeah. I grew up like spear fishing, surfing, fishing, doing fun stuff because we were away. On holiday. You know? Yeah. So it's a, I've always had a good experience. Yeah. But on the other side of things, I think if I liked parties and having friends around, it'd be very hard to lock people in because they're away. Yeah. So Yeah. And also for, for sport, it's not very good because it's like often from 1st of January. So I was always like the small kid. Well, I bet you've trumped them now, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, like maybe that fueled yeah. my, <laughs> fueled my The motivation really came yeah. from that, didn't it? Yeah. 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 Mm. All right. So, <laughs> so, so let's jump into just a few questions around what you do. But how would you explain what you do in like a... 30 second, 60 second spiel. Oh, like an elevator pitch. Yes. Oh, okay. I am a mum of three and a nutritionist and I've been in the industry for over a decade. Mm. Um, I have two businesses, Brown Paper Nutrition and Day One Fertility. And Mm. my mission is to support women and then obviously their children um, in understanding nutrition and helping to simplify nutrition science so it becomes health becomes achievable and accessible for everyone Mm. Um, I do it in a way that it is about abundance and really finding a connection with your health and with your body because life feels better when you feel good Mm. so yeah that's what I started out doing over a decade ago it's what I still do now with just as much passion as when I started Mm. um and I think probably having children along the way has made me feel even greater purpose because I want to make sure that, you know, how I'm setting up their health, but also the health of their friends and their fam- fr- uh, friends' parents and the community, you know, it all trickles on to other people and affects all of us in some ways. So mm. um, I really love what I do and I feel, you know, not thankful because I've worked my ass off, but... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm really humble that I get to connect with the people that I do every day and that I get to work with people in ways that um, can make them feel really empowered by their health and nutrition. So with the two businesses, can you explain the difference between them? And then also on the back of that, how you got into 
each one of them? Like, did they start simultaneously? Yeah, was it no. one? And then like, <laughs> oh, now I've got this other idea that I want to Yeah, wanna yeah. I do. mean, one, running one business is kind of enough, especially with three <laughs> tiny, not two tiny people and, and a teenager. But um, so Brown Paper Nutrition was my founding baby. Mm. Um, and where did the name come from? Oh, <laughs> so when I was sort of first learning how to cook and understanding food, I d- did a lot of cooking and primarily baking. So I would wrap it up in a brown paper bag and give it to people. Um, and it wasn't always like healthy food at the start. It was just a learning process and mm. imparting something onto someone else. Um, I'm sure there was a component that my family couldn't keep up with them as much as I was cooking, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was certainly lovely to offer people a taste as the years progressed of what good health is, mm. a taste of good nutrition. Yeah. Because, you know, 10 years ago as well, there was like still this massive disconnect whereby um, healthy food was sometimes kind of a bit rabbity, like, you know, like yeah. salads and things that weren't necessarily sustaining and um yeah, there was. I really felt that there was still that disconnect. It was quite so off-putting for the general population. Like, I don't I want to so. eat that. Yeah, it's, like just not, it's not tasty. And it wasn't common, and there wasn't education pieces in the media as much. And no there was, yeah, it was just a very different era. And social media wasn't as rampant as it is now, mm. right? So, um, yeah, when I started Brown Paper Nutrition, I just graduated. Um, I had a small online business. Um, seeing clients and then because I wanted to give people this taste of good nutrition and health I started a little stall at the Bondi markets on a weekend and I'd bake healthy treats and healthy foods and I connected with the local community and that was like such an incredible time to build that face-to-face contact but to also grow a community in that way Um, and really special to me because it then you know all of these people would get behind you and support you throughout all of the years to come in different ways. Mm. Um, And it's so nice to still stay so connected to those people. So, um, yeah, so Brown Paper Nutrition really came through um, teaching and educating and with a clinical practice. And it's evolved over the years. I've had whole food catering as part of Brown Paper Nutrition. I've had a meal delivery business. But when I wanted to focus on my own health and reduce stress and conceive again it was time to pivot and I wanted to keep that but also use the knowledge and education that I'd built over the years to build into a new platform and to make sure that what I'd learnt was out there for other people to enjoy and learn from as well because Mm. um, going into a time of life like you know pregnancy and becoming a mother again even though you know, it's 13 years on, but or well, 10 years on when I had my my second. Um, there's a lot that you need to do for your body, and for a lot of the time, a lot of women or couples or individuals are sort of, you know, they go to the doctor with a positive pregnancy test. They're given the advice of a sort of substandard prenatal and a list of foods you shouldn't eat, mm. and then sent on your merry way. And I wanted to use what I'd learnt in my studies, in my practice, in the practical being a mother side of things, Mm. um, to offer people the support and to help them feel empowered by their health and nutrition for preconception and for pregnancy and for post-birth. Because when you have that knowledge, you know, you have the confidence to advocate for the health of both you and your baby. So Mm. if I can impart that onto people, through day one fertility then you know that's an incredible thing to be able to do and Mm. I get up every day and I feel so much purpose in what I do yeah 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 um but I didn't gel the two businesses in any way because it's it speaks to different people at different stages of life a little bit so I agree with that yeah Mm. so take a step back from having a positive pregnancy test and then wondering what to do if you're trying to fall pregnant what's ways that people can optimize their nutrition for that purpose like is there some guidelines that you have obviously you you have a business on it so so you could just be like well go buy my you know go buy my product but for people that are looking for tips or things that maybe you think that the gps or people that are advising people to fall pregnant 
like maybe they're leaving out things mm-hmm. that you're like, well, this is something that I would do. Is yeah. there anything like that you could you could help people out with? How many hours have we got? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we could actually talk about this the whole time, but yeah. I'll try and be really succinct. Um, when it comes to trying to fall pregnant, I think probably the most important thing is thinking about that preconception period, mm. right? So even though 50% of pregnancies are unplanned, um, for those other 50%, make a plan. A bit like training, right? <laughs> yeah. Or running a marathon. Mm. Like you'd make a plan for all of that. You'd program for it. And I feel like this is where the piece where people perhaps don't yet have it out there enough is that you need to make a plan and work on preconception nutrition before trying to conceive because mm. you want to make sure you're optimizing the nutrition in your body and your health ready for conception. Um, in terms of what some simple takeaways that I'd, I'd can offer. Um, There was a recent Harvard Research Review published and it was based on a landmark study of um, literally thousands of participants done over several years. And from that study they were able to look at some significant dietary changes that you can make that can help improve your fertility by up to around 65%, which is a lot, right? Mm. And this was women. So looking at what foods and lifestyle changes can support ovulation and fertility because you have to have healthy eggs, you have to ovulate regularly Mm. in order to fall pregnant. And a few of the dietary changes that were at the forefront were avoiding trans fats and reducing saturated fats. And this is really important because a lot of people are eating a primarily very ultra highly processed diet, Mm. right? Full of processed foods and these ultra um, processed foods, you know, packaged cakes and cookies and breads and crackers and crisps and all these sorts of things or um, vegetable spreads, things like that um, contain trans fats and saturated fats, which can make our bodies very inflamed. And we want our bodies to be in a low stress, low inflammation state Mm. in order to conceive. Um, so you avoid the trans fats, take out saturated fats and replace with something else, right? Because we don't want to leave people and just strip people out with foods. We want to make sure, yeah, yeah, but you replace with those beautiful healthy fats. Mm. So poly and monounsaturated fats. So things like your olive oil, nuts and seeds, avocado, you're getting lots of those in there because they cool inflammation in the body and they support ovulation and they help with insulin sensitivity. So we want to get all of those beautiful healthy fats in there. Mm. Another one that was really important was increasing your intake of vegetable protein Um, and vegetable proteins. So things like your tofu, tempeh, um, legumes, so lentils, chickpeas, kidney beans, all showed favorable fertility um, outcomes. And why is it vegetable protein? Like why not protein animal based? So this is the the good part of it as well, right? So it's not about having a vegetarian diet. It's Mm. just about replacing even just one meal a day with a vegetable protein base because of the nutrients that are in your vegetable proteins that support ovulation. Also lower in saturated fats, Mm. which they were trying to reduce. So by no means do you have to be on a plant predominant diet or a vegetarian diet, but just looking at how you can make a few little swaps here and there. Nice. And remembering as well that those vegetable proteins are also super rich in fiber. Mm. So you're supporting gut microbiome as well as, which also leads into the health of your vaginal microbiome, for instance. Mm. Um, So there's plenty of reasons backed by science why you'd be increasing, you know, things like your veggie proteins. Um, They also noted that it's really important to increase your intake of vegetarian um, or plant-based iron. Iron's really important for ovulation and a lot of women, um, you know, will go into pregnancy already on the lower end of iron and then become very deplete throughout pregnancy because the demands in pregnancy are so high. Like, Mm. I don't know if you guys had came into any complications throughout your pregnancy, but the number of women we see is pretty significant. Yeah, we've definitely seen iron decrease over time. Yeah. Yeah. Which they say is normal. Like, we haven't reached the critical point where it's like we need to take huge action but it's definitely been something that i noticed yeah or that we've noticed yeah yeah and women you know there are so many iron deficiency is the most common deficiency globally right Mm. because there's so many women 
we're menstruating, we're losing iron every month. Mm. So, so many women are walking in and if you walk in blind and without a little bit of education, then you don't, you only know what you know, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> if you yeah. walk in with some education, then you you have the opportunity to be aware and to make some changes to your diet in order to help your chances of a you know favorable outcome. Yeah. Um, another point they made was that it's about slow carb, not low carb. Yeah. And this is really important because people can get really caught up in these restrictions when it comes to diet and certainly for people that might have been on a more challenged fertility journey they might be restricting a lot of food because they're taught like you're bombarded with information and mm. different blogs that they might be turning to that aren't necessarily backed by science will be telling you to take this out and take that out but your body actually needs carbohydrate for healthy ovulation and we also need carbohydrate for the health of our uterus for uterine lining right so that when we are trying to conceive we've got a beautiful healthy uterus for implantation so carbs are really important so our whole food carbs things like our oats and our rice barley quinoa buckwheat sweet potato like all of those juicy delicious carbs are mm. really important in a fertility diet per se yeah. fertility yeah way of life um and also, you know, drinking water over drinking sugary sodas or alcohol and limiting caffeine. Like, have your coffee a day, but not having too much caffeine. It's depletive. Um, alcohol for obvious reasons. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and sugary sodas also obviously um, peak your blood glucose levels. And we want to make sure that we're keeping insulin levels nice and stable. So mm. that all impacts ovulation. They were the just some of the key dietary tweaks that people, anyone, can take away and make immediately, essentially, mm. to improve their fertility significantly. And what about lifestyle changes? So well, lifestyle changes, yeah. are super important as well, right? Yeah. What did you guys do? Uh, well, we, we are already, you know, very active. Yeah. You know, like, it, like not that my wife needed to increase her physical activity but like i'm a personal trainer so yeah. I'm, I'm already very active yes um so and we met in a gym so our relationship is you, you know it's like <laughs> hot and sweaty by the water cooler <laughs> like it's, <yeah. laughs> it's it's founded you know like around physical activity yeah. in gym and, and and stuff like that so we are already doing things like having these kind of guidelines of 10,000 steps and yep. having, you know, she was already going to the gym four to five times per week. Um, so in terms of like activity and sleep, you know, we are, man, probably the <laughs> like most boring adults ever, like that didn't have kids already, you yeah, know, like yeah. cause we were trying to get to bed at like nine. Yeah. Because we were waking up at five, five thirty. Yeah, she'd, of course. She'd go to work. I'd, you know, I'd start yep. working and all, and all this kind of stuff. So we didn't like we already tried to dial that in. Yep. Before we were trying to get pregnant or, or or do anything like that. So we didn't make huge changes. Yeah. I I wouldn't say we even made any changes, but that's you know coming from us who you know I'm literally sitting down studying. Yeah. You know what's the best <laughs> way to live? Yeah. You know, like yeah. how do we have the best you yeah. know, body possible that's doing what we want it to do and stuff yeah. like that, but. I guess I'm also very aware that people don't come from this background yeah. and people are just like, I want to have a kid, but they're not training or, you know, maybe they're not even prioritizing steps in any way or physical activity in general. It doesn't yeah. have to be steps like oh, I'm going for a walk, but, you know, going for a swim, going for a bike or, or doing yeah. whatever. So, yeah, we didn't make a lot of changes yeah. uh, personally, but I know that for a lot of people it's required. Yeah, absolutely. And for things like movement, and you would know this all too well, mm. especially if you're coming from nothing and that's your base, and but you're wanting to conceive, you want to keep it low stress. Mm. So hit exercise, things like that. Not such a friendly one for fertility, yeah. but gentle walks and doing movement that you love so you, that you actually keep your body movement moving is mm. favorable over doing things that you don't love because you're trying to achieve something right yeah because it means you'll get up and do it like it's sustainable yeah you're exactly like, oh, i like swimming i'm gonna yep. go for a swim yeah mm. and we already have so much stress in our lives and stress wreaks havoc on hormones mm. and in both women and men but certainly in women it can wreak havoc on your hormones and mm -hmm. really affect um fertility outcomes so keeping exercise low stress looking at your lifestyle and being really um you know 
realistic about how you can reduce stress in your lives as well. Mm. For women and men, um, we always dive into um, investigating and reducing things like environmental toxins and what's around you. Mm -hmm. So um, we follow at day one a four-step process, which is investigate, balance, nourish, and reduce. And part of that process is looking at these environmental toxins, right? So for the men, for instance, because it takes two to tango, Mm -hmm. um, you know, you'd be looking at if they're in, if they're a tradie and if they're, you know, working in places where there's lots of dust from different paints or if they're pulling up asbestos or whatever they're inhaling on their daily basis or if your walk to work is perhaps along the main the road, road. Mm. yeah, and you can take some back streets to avoid the inhalation of pollution. Um, for women, it might be, and this is super common actually, what they're putting on their skin every day mm. and looking at how we can reduce the toxins and the chemicals present in your lifestyle because things like fragrances are known endocrine disruptors. Mm. So even IVF clinics these days will ask their patients, you know, to avoid, you know, products with fragrances in them and they're everywhere and phthalates and things like that. So we want to make sure that we're reducing um, those elements, stress and environmental toxicity. And they're the lifestyle components that really a lot of people really need to focus on, especially if you live in the city, because not everyone has the capacity to go and boot off to the country when they're trying to conceive. <laughs> just live this peaceful live life. Live in a cottage. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do yoga with the cows and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> breathe fresh air and eat organic. Like, we have to be realists. So yeah. what can we do that are, what can we do to help this outcome with tools that are at our fingertips? Mm. Um, and those elements are really important for people and you can action immediately. And it's not like there aren't replacements for things. It's just about getting savvy about um, what it is that's in front of you, what you're, what you're eating, what you're drinking, um, how you're moving your body, what you're putting on your body, how much sleep you get, mm. you know? Um, and finding a bit of joy in your day as well. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, don't just be punching the whole time and leaving... Um, this idea of conceiving to this stressful moment at the end of the day, like you've got to... Yeah, you, let's go. You, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> pretty much. Start the timer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is unfortunately what it does come for a lot of couples. But yeah. um, do what you can to put some different strategies in place to give yourself the best outcome. Mm. Yeah, one thing I'm, I've been communicating a lot, not so much with social media because it's not the most interesting idea that people latch on to, but that exercise is also a stress in life. Yeah. And especially with my female clients, they struggle to have these longer rest periods because Mm. they are, well, previously conditioned to do cardio and, you know, do kind of workouts like that. And I've uh, hit hit training and stuff like that. And and, and I feel like the overall knowledge base of content that's around is slowly getting better. Yeah. That we're not getting, well, we, not me speaking as a female, but like... (laughs) you know, that, that idea is becoming less prevalent. Yeah. Um, but even with rest periods, some of my clients struggle because they want to just do it and just, you know, have a high heart rate Mm. and just be sweaty and jumping from exercise to exercise. Yeah. Um, and that's, well, number one, that's not how you get strong if that's a goal, but also I guess if you're trying to fall pregnant and conceive, going and doing workouts where you're just running around and bouncing is probably not going to be the best idea. Like, not the best. Yeah. And no. I try to like, obviously training in, in general is a great step to take, mm-hmm. but yeah, allowing time to, to train, I guess in a more efficient way, mm-hmm. but also understand that training is a stress because sometimes we see it as a, as a, as a thing that's not stressful. Like it's therapeutic. Like yeah. I find training really therapeutic. Same. And I, I look forward to it. If I don't do it, I feel a certain way and I'd feel uneasy and I feel agitated. Mm. Um, so I'd really look forward to doing it. But um, sometimes it's hard to know that that is actually stressful on your body. Mm. But you see it as a therapeutic thing. So then you like, OK, you still work the same or you still have a stressful day or a stressful life. But then you pour this kind of intense training on top of it. And then we kind of wonder why we're so wired or yeah. things aren't happening that you know, the way that they usually do yeah. or are supposed to. Yeah. And that's, mm. the, you know, I think importantly for a lot of women before trying to conceive, 
there's a lot of patterning that sometimes needs to be undone mm. in order to be in a healthy place to conceive and to be calm and settle throughout your pregnancy. But also it sets you up for postpartum when mm. you're just going to have to take it easy <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, look after yourself mm. so that you can look after your baby in the most gentle way mm. because that then sets you up for way further down the track and mm. you can return to training then. But sometimes, you know, people are so obsessive about, you know, exercise and training and this not having this rest period because that feeling is addictive, right? And it's a really hard thing to give up. So, you know, when we do have our clients that might be that way inclined, we really do try to help set up planning and undo some patterns that serve them better than where they're at mm. so that they start to reduce the stress in their body. With environmental toxins that you're saying, yeah, I'm not sure if this falls into that category, but like my wife is really looking at everything like fabric softeners and washing powders and, and stuff like that. Does that fall into the same thing? Like, is that a huge, or, n or maybe not a huge, but is that something to consider? Because now she's ordering... You know, we're like n almost not getting anything from Woolies anymore. It's yeah. like we're going online to get these ones that don't have, and I don't know the exact things that they don't have yeah. or that they do have, but they're, she does all the research on it because she's, you know, very interested in it, especially when it comes to washing our yeah. to be born baby's clothes yep. and blankets and all that kind of stuff. She yeah. wants her skin to be very, you know, free of this and that. Is that something to consider as well? Is that a huge thing or is that just kind of something to throw in there? It's definitely very reasonable what mm. she's doing. And I don't know yeah. um, if she's not, she's not the first that I would have heard. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of women and mothers and families will do that. And I think the best way to think about that, right, in terms of if you're a couple trying to conceive mm. is toxic load, right? Mm. So it's the accumulation of toxicity across the course of the day, week, year, years that's coming into play that we're trying to reduce in your body. Mm. So you don't have to do everything overnight or, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day, right? Yeah. So just pull back on things here and there where possible, like... For instance, we say where possible to our clients, if you can choose and can afford organic for certain things, then choose organic. Like some th sometimes that is, it's same cost. It's not a big thing, yeah. you know, or like simple other things would be if you can choose a BPA free tin of beans, yeah. then you go for that one. Cause we know BPA wreaks havoc on our hormones. Um, and just making those simple changes so that you're just reducing little portions here and there is really advantageous. Mm. And it'll count up over time. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Exactly. Because it is this build up. It's over years. And then, you know, some couples are spending years trying to conceive mm. and not necessarily having this information or this knowledge to know that if they could just pull a few things here and there mm. um, and understand how to optimize their health and nutrition then they put themselves in a much better position for conception and for a healthy pregnancy yeah yeah i've seen that i've seen some people struggle for a long time mm. and then some people just you know it just happens first time um, yeah is there a genetic role involved in that or is that you know, just their lifestyle that they happen to live or... Because some people are just completely unaware, you know, and, and like you're saying, 50% yeah. is accidental, 50% yeah. isn't. Is that... Like, do genetics play a big factor or is that... Some... Not some really in some cases, yes, mm. but there's lots of different factors that can be <clears throat> at play, right? Age, undoubtedly. Mm. Um, a woman's born with all of her eggs. So we have one to two million eggs when we're born. By the time we hit puberty, there's around three to 400,000. And then we lose about 30 to 40 each day ongoing. So your optimal time to conceive is definitely in the earlier part of your life in your 20s and early 30s because mm. the science does show us that after 35, fertility does start to decline. Um, and they use that awful, god-awful term, geriatric pregnancy. When <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you fall pregnant after 35. Yeah. So I've yeah. had two of those. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like... I'm not a grandma. <laughs> <laughs> um, so age is definitely a factor. Yeah. Um, and then for some people, there might be underlying um, medical conditions that have not, you know, they, they just don't know about. Mm. So some women might have PCOS, polycystic ovaries. 
um, maybe there's endometriosis at play. Um, and what we uncover with a lot of our clientele is a lot of thyroid abnormalities mm. and that can affect ovulation. So, you know, that might be something that they just don't know about, that unless they work with someone who does, they might just keep pushing through and pushing through and hoping for the best mm. without doing the appropriate testing to know what they're working with and what they need to change and replete. Um, Working with someone and understanding as well um, your cycle is really important mm. in conceiving. So it might feel like your colleague has conceived really quickly, but maybe they're a little bit more in tune with their cycle. You know, they're looking at their basal body temperature. They know the rise and fall. Um, they're very aware of their body. They're looking at cervical mucus. All of these signs in our body. Mm. Um, libido is a big sign um, as well of when you're ovulating. So there's a reason, right? Because yeah. your body is like primed and ready for to conceive. Um, and, you know, a lot of clients and, and people are working with apps and they're waiting on a calendar to tell them when they're ovulating, when you can definitely use the app, but you need to be tuning into your body as well and understanding what your body's doing at different times of the month mm. um, and that's a really empowering experience as well for a woman or for someone who ovulates I should say um, because you learn so much about your body and that sets you up not only for conception but for all of the rest of your life like you can mm. really read start to read and understand your hormones in such a different way that you can explain why you feel like this at a certain stage of your cycle and why you feel like down here at a certain stage of your cycle because you know, you, you have such a better understanding of it. Um, there's male factor infertility that counts for 30 to 50% of infertility. Um, so always, if you, are, if you have a male partner, then he needs to get, you know, come to the table and be at the appointments with your naturopath or nutritionist mm. and understanding what he needs to do to play his role in optimising his nutrition so that you can conceive healthily together. Mm. And then... I guess the other one which we've touched on just previously is stress, right? Mm. So sometimes, especially if people have had a long and challenging fertility journey, it does get stressful, and, but they can become really laser focused on, as I said, like restricting certain things or not allowing enough of something like, you know, carbohydrate or not, not allowing fats in for whatever reason. And they might feel like they're eating the healthiest diet for their fertility, but they're so stressed about what they're eating that it's actually at like... The, at the detriment. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's, you know, it's really important to look at stress in all aspects because health is not like... Nutrition is not just what you put in your mouth. And health is not just going to the gym and doing exercise and then eating well. It's so many different parts that combine. Mm. And when people understand each of those better within their lifestyle, then they just set themselves up so much better for a good result mm. for a baby. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And how about pregnancy? So now we big question. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. What, what about part? pregnancy? Yeah. What, do you, what do you think <laughs> about it? <laughs> um, so now that, say, we've fallen pregnant, yeah. is there any other things that I guess you would add to what, you know, once again, the GP would say or the person that you go see would yep. say, the obstetrician would say, like, nutritionally or lifestyle wise yeah is it the same guidelines or is it slightly different it it differs ever so slightly i suppose what most women will come across in the first trimester is morning sickness mm. which really sucks yeah. and for some women it's not just in the morning it's all day yeah we experienced that oh it's it was so like, tough man morning sickness it yeah. was like night time at work oh i really feel for you yeah because it's so debilitating and exhausting mm. and you just, you know, you go from feeling so great potentially in preconception to feeling like, pardon my language, absolute <laughs> shit mm. for a time when you feel like you should be awesome. <laughs> like yeah. I'm pregnant. I am life. I am, you know, like yeah, all these great things. Life. I'm growing life. I am woman, like, you know, <laughs> and you just feel like crawling under the doona with a bucket near you and just it just being the worst. So um, we really, you know, encourage people to take it easy on themselves in the first trimester. You know, you may not be wanting to eat the way that you previously ate that's okay. <laughs> yeah. That's why preconception nutrition is so important mm. because you've replenished your body 
with the nutrients specific for fertility and for pregnancy. Mm. So you're not going to deplete them that quickly. And that's also why it's so important that whilst you don't feel like eating much, you're taking a really good quality prenatal vitamin. Mm. Um, and second trimester people, you know, they get their energy back and they're feeling good. Um, so that's a time when you can really dive back into eating lots of those really abundant foods, your iron rich foods, your choline rich mm. foods and creating meals that you feel like eating again. Um, and then third trimester, you know, you're feeling pretty stuffed, like I'm sure Kiki is at the moment. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you're sort of waddling around like, yeah. a, like a mother duck before yeah. you're a mother. Um, and by the time you've had a few children, you're just like, everyone can just do everything for me because <laughs> <laughs> I can't do much. Um, so, you know, I think like you just have to learn to tread gently in pregnancy. Pregnancy mm. is a stress test, mm. the ultimate stress test. Mm. Um, so rather than putting more stress on your body at a time when it's working so hard and growing and supporting your health and your baby's health, you just... You just need to take it easy and reduce life stress, not go and do all the renovating and all the things that people like to do during yeah. pregnancy <laughs> and pair it back a bit and just, you know, eat abundantly and eat good quality food. You don't have to eat double the amount. You're not eating for two people. Yeah. You need to think about your micronutrient intake throughout pregnancy and focus on that being, you know, abundant and charged, not necessarily your sheer quantity of food. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And so... We move through this and we say we have a nice, healthy birth. Yeah. What have you found that mothers struggle with on the back of that? And this doesn't have to be nutritional. It can be lifestyle-wise. It could be like mental health-wise as well. Because mm. I've, I've heard and I guess witnessed, as we were talking about before the podcast, Yeah. friends and family have had kids. And there's been a ton of different experiences that I've seen from you know, fathers that parent differently, mothers parent differently. And as a couple, they, you know, some struggle, some thrive. Yeah. It's all very different. Like, what have you found, I guess, most commonly with mothers? Yeah. Or parents in general? And what would, you, like, what advice would you offer? I think there's this incredible pressure that people feel like they have to get back to something. Mm. Like, back to normal, back to their body, back yeah. to their social life, back to work back mm. to doing all these things that they did in their previous life. But when you have a, a child, a, a little baby, life changes mm. forever. There is, you know, you can get back into your exercise and things like that, but in terms of getting your body back, I think it would probably be a really common one for a lot of women. Mm. Your body has changed forever. Mm. You grew a human. That's the coolest thing ever, mm. you know? enjoy and celebrate that rather than spending your days when they actually in the end move super fast even though they feel like a really long day and night merged all together when they're <laughs> newborns because they cry and feed and poop and yeah. you know you're just doing the same thing on repeat but don't sit there and think about how you're going to get back into shape and you know get out and do this that and the other because mm. it'll come in time when you can go and do things that you love again but those very short months when they're tiny 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 people are so important and you can do so much to just look after yourself and your baby in that time mm. so that would be one another is that i think it's really important and especially because you know people are on social media all the time switch off and stop comparing what your experience is with your baby to what someone else's is mm. because your experience is completely unique um, and everyone will have a piece of advice they want to offer you or chime in and tell you what you're not doing right yeah. and that can be really traumatizing <laughs> um, including sometimes family that want to yeah. knock on the door and come in and have a cup of tea and hold the baby and then you're left to sort of clean things up yeah. like you are so entitled to say no to things that you know don't serve you and your little family at that point in time mm. if that's what's best for you and your little family and sometimes that can be really hard for people but it's totally okay yeah and you're also similarly it's so important to ask for help because you don't have to do it all just because you think that you can doesn't mean that you should you know people 
we need our village. We need that, you know, there is that saying, we need a village to raise a child. And mm. we really do. We need people around us that want to help us, not necessarily in ways that sitting on the couch and having a tea, but, you know, <laughs> the best thing that I, you, you can do is leave food on someone's doorstep mm. with no expectation of going in and meeting the baby. Yeah. Or if you do go in and meet the baby, say to the mum, I'll, I'll hold the baby, go have a shower. All by yourself without the worry of the scream, like go and have some time just to yourself. Mm. And maybe in that shower, she can let those tears out that she might have been holding in because mm. she's shattered because that's the reality. Yeah. But that's some, some of the best things that you can do and things that I think people forget or they don't feel like they can. So allow this, you know, may this be your permission slip. Mm. Yeah, that's a super practical piece of advice like yeah. i've seen you know like especially parents because they just want to come over and hold the baby or yeah. see the baby and obviously they're your parents so they just have this you know i'll, I'll just walk in and yeah i've seen that not go so well yeah as well and yeah i think it's such an important conversation because i'd to be honest i'd never thought about it i'll just like yeah people will come over and it'll be all right yeah. but I, you know i'm not I'm not carrying a baby. Yeah. <laughs> so, it can and, be really and overwhelming. And I'm not feeding every two hours, every three yeah. hours and, and, and doing all that stuff. So yeah. it's, it's really nice to hear as a, like, I, I guess a to-be father. Yeah. Because it's like, yeah, it's, it's stuff that I never really think about. Yeah. Because you know, I'm just really play it, you know, play it by air type of guy. Yeah. Oh, people are coming over. Let's get ready. But it's, a, it's obviously a different experience for the mother. Yeah, totally. And mm. as we was talking about before the podcast, like, it sounds as though you guys have this beautiful, very clear communication space right now. Mm. And when people are exhausted, it's actually a lot harder to communicate clearly. So I suppose by setting it up in this la latter part of pregnancy that you mm. know, you're gonna deal with some of the things that might not be well communicated when you've just had a baby, or if that's a habit that you create about sitting down and just talking openly as a couple about your parenting values or what, what you feel like who who works best in what moment like mm. is dad better at doing the early part of the evening so mum can get a bit of an extra stint of sleep mm. and he takes baby for a bottle for the first feed or something like that mm. or is dad getting up and at least getting baby and bringing baby over to mama for throughout the night in those early weeks mm. you have to just work as a team and understand how to communicate effectively so that everyone's you know going through this and learning their way through this whole new experience that's really raw in the best way possible. Mm. Yeah. So, like, what are some changes that you had to make as a mother with, like, I, I, I guess I'm interested in, like, the schedule of, like, day-to-day -day <laughs> like, work. Like, it's, yeah. it's like, like, obviously, you don't have to share everything, but, like, it's... I find it really interesting to see how people work out their routine because that's something that I'm really obsessed about. Yeah. Is, you know, obviously I run my own business too. So I, I think about that a lot. Yeah. And obviously I'm, I know that I'm going to be a father, which is a huge priority. Yeah. But I also know that for me and for many other fathers, it's like you feel quite responsible for a certain amount of time because they're off work and, mm. you know, you feel like you have this extra weight on your yep. shoulder that you have to carry. And though it's not really extra weight, that's kind of just what it feels like. Yep. You know, you feel like you have to step up as a man yep. and, you know, start providing. Like. Yep. So I'm, I've been thinking, but obviously we'll find out when we have baby, like yeah. what routine, like, well, I wake up and put the baby on and go for a walk and, you know, let her sleep or will I do that later in the day or, yeah. you know. Like, is there anything that you found that is super helpful or that you found really worked for you that other people could apply? Yeah, I think the more that the partner can step in and help, um, the better the mother will feel because mm. she can get a sense of just feeling herself. You know, a lot of mothers feel really touched out if they're constantly attached to baby, if they're doing all the settling, all the burping, all, you know, all the feeding, all these things because... Um, of that pressure or perhaps the partner or the um, dad in the relationship are nervous about stepping in and interfering. Mm. Um, so as much as I feel like as much as you can s step in and, and give a hand wherever possible mm. is really advantageous. You'll find your groove, um, no doubt, in no time, whether that's... And you'll find a way to work 
a newborn and a little baby into the routine that already exists if it's a strong routine that works for both of you, mm. right? If no routine currently exists, then it makes it a lot harder to find one. Mm. And some babies will really adapt well to routine and a lot of babies are really fluid. Um, similarly, so that's how some parents feel. They prefer mm. a more fluid approach and other people really like routine. Um, but however you can set yourself up to just look after her in postpartum, look after your wife because mm. she needs so much support in that postpartum period because your body is naturally deplete after birth. Um, it's really emotional because your hormones are everywhere. <laughs> yeah, we're, ex- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're still going through yeah. it. Yeah, we're still navigating it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it kind of comes out of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> Like the, uh, Hi. Yeah. Actually, this morning on the way to the gym, there was a dog with uh, there was a dog with three legs, right? And right. I was like, oh, there's a dog. I was like, oh, there's a dog with three legs. It's really yeah. cute. And then my wife started crying. Oh. And I was like, what's wrong? She's like, there's a dog. She was crying because the dog had three legs oh. and she didn't want to see it. You know, which would never happen. Yeah. Um, like normally, but yeah, yeah, it's just a heightened emotion. Totally. Yeah. Totally heightened. Um, so I feel like you know. Wherever possible, dads can step in and help mums and nourish them and support them. Mm. Like make sure the water bottle's topped up for feeding. Make sure there's a little snack jar of nuts Mm. in the locations where mum likes to feed. Step in wherever possible. Like you might have priorities about going surfing. Maybe they need to just be paired back a bit or, you know, all those things. And you'll find your groove. But, you Mm. know, women in the postpartum period in that four weeks – or 40 days, essentially, um, following birth, that, the golden month, um, they need so much nurturing. Mm. So wherever a partner can step in and support that and reach out to friends and say, you know what, we would really love a meal train or anything dropped on our doorstep because mm. I suck at cooking and I can own that now. Yeah. And, you know, do those sorts of things so that you're looking after them is... Mm. I think my best piece of advice yeah, there. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And and what about your training and nutrition that you do personally? I'm interested because <laughs> cause, uh, like it's nice to hear it from a mother yeah. herself, you know, because there's a lot of, you know, I'll oh, do this and train this many times per week. But yeah. like, yeah, what do you do and what do you find works for you? Now? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So or, 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 and, yeah. and previously, if you want to take us on, I yeah. guess, how your training has evolved because mine's evolved too yeah. and, and, and like not – as me as a person and then a to be parent and then a parent later on, like yeah. just as a person, yep. my interests have changed. Yes. Um, so yeah. What's your journey been like? Um, I love exercise. I don't take the privilege of moving my body daily for granted. Mm. I, re- I really do believe. And I think that's where I've really landed now is that um, movement is a privilege. So find something you love mm. and do something to move your body every single day. Um, I definitely have in the past um, used training, like obviously as a stress release, but also it was a stressor because I had a savage eating disorder for all of my teens and most of my 20s. It was when I felt pregnant with Jet, my first, that I actually looked at that marker and went, it's time to resolve this. Mm. and I used training in a way that it was about burning off the, or getting rid of the guilt. Mm. If I just burn this, then I can, you know, it was this equation constantly, um, which is also, you know, things that helped evolve into my work in nutrition as well. So um, it definitely has gone very far away from that place. Um, I've learnt a lot about my body certainly in the past three years than I more so than any other time of my life um, with having two babies essentially back to back 17 months apart and being a, uh, a grandma um, <laughs> pregnancy a geriatric pregnancy <laughs> um, <laughs> so I really uh, you know took heed of the professionals being my physios and had them look at my current injuries and um, my pregnancies and things that had come up and went very gently with my training throughout pregnancy, still stayed strong and stayed active and things. Um, But, you know, learnt the big lesson after having Jet, my first, almost 13 years ago, 
I just I got back into it way too quickly and re- I, d- I definitely damaged myself after that. Like it was like three weeks later. Mm. And this is the knowledge that I didn't have, right? Like mm. no one at that point said to me, don't train for six weeks. Don't, yeah. you know, like go gently. I didn't know. Mm. Um, so I really learnt from that. And then in these subsequent pregnancies, I just learnt to go a bit slower. Um, December two years ago, um, when after my third baby, so things weren't feeling right still. Like I had label tears in my hips that had been diagnosed some years earlier. But I just like I could not move my legs in and out of bed, in and out of the car. It was just painful to put on my shoes, all these things. So I went and did some further investigations. And I've actually got osteoarthritis in both hips. So I'm lined up for a f- bilateral hip replacement in February this year. Really? So actually I'm a granny. <laughs> um, but I'm a vibrant one. <laughs> um, so I really, you know when I say that, like it's a privilege to move your body and find something that makes your body feel good and you can move through life without injury or without pain. Like I really do like every day live and breathe that. Like Mm. I get up and I do things to make sure that I'm still active and I feel good. I feel strong. And I definitely am one of those people that is like addictive to the endorphin rush Mm. after training and I sweat heaps. So I get that beautiful (laughs) detox as well when I train, like I sweat buckets. So, um, but I really, I, I love that I've learnt so much about my body in this time frame and I can still understand it in a way that I can find things that give me the high that I need without mm. giving me the pain that I don't want. So, um, yeah, so at the moment, actually, the, our training is very unique <laughs> um, in that um, we're doing a, what's we've titled the Ironman Challenge for January. We're do- I'm doing a fundraiser with my partner yeah. um, to raise money for motor neuron disease because we lost his dad to motor neuron disease a few years ago. So each January we're dedicating to raising funds for motor neuron disease. And this month we're doing an Ironman Challenge. So each week we are completing a 180K ride, a 3.8 kilometre swim and a 42.2 kilometre he'll, he'll do a run and I do it on the ski erg all movements, modalities that um, I just don't feel pain from, but I get this amazing high from. I'm doing it with purpose because we're raising funds. And for me, certainly coming from a background where I loved competing as well, like I loved running and doing all those events and I was a competitive swimmer in my teens. I'm really like, I love the competition and the... um, bigger side of it so it's nice to do something now that I've finished having all my babies um, that I feel like you know I'm just I'm releasing all this stuff at the same time and I feel really good Mm. and that's what I speak a lot about certainly in my platform as well Um, I don't take that lightly that people listen when you know you say things like movement is a privilege so Mm. just don't make it a punish don't don't go to the hit classes because you feel like you should because that'll be your best body because your colleague loves it. Like, go and do yoga if that's what you want to go. Mm. Go dance if that's what you want to go and do. Mm. Like, go do triathlons if that's what, you know, floats your boat. Yeah. But just find something you love. Yeah, I feel like injuries are a reminder totally. that movement is privilege. Yeah. Like, even, you know, obviously my injury that I've had previous or just kind of recently is not as intense as yours, but I just kind of hurt my rotator cuff and then yeah. it's hasn't healed properly and it's just like been a while that I haven't been able to use my shoulder properly but even that as someone that likes to really like push themselves and lift as heavy as possible and like push my push my body to limits I started jujitsu as well like a Mm. year and a half ago so I've been doing that and I wasn't able to do what I wanted to do I was like man when I get back to using my body properly I'm gonna like do my warm-ups I'm gonna make sure that I'm warm I'm gonna do my stretches if I need to do stretches because it's like yeah you have to kind of have those kind of reminders well you don't have to but i feel like i treat them as yeah like all right bro get your shit together you know yeah. like <laughs> yeah get the, you know do the rotator cuff stuff yeah. that you don't want to do before yep. you're at the gym but like you kind of have to do it and it's kind of that investment into longevity totally mm. and i feel like you fall in love with things that perhaps you really resented before when you have injury yeah like 100%. you start to fall in love with things like your warm-up yeah. <laughs> activation i fall it like i hated the foam roller before 
man, I love that thing now. Like, yeah. <laughs> and I, I keep it like in a really obvious place. And when my children are watching cartoons or if we're watching a movie at night, I get on the foam roller and it's not such a thing yeah. anymore. Like, yeah. you know, it's when... It's just part of it's just what you part have of to life. do. Yeah. Well, the ski erg, like I hated that machine yeah. so much <laughs> until 18 months ago or so or, you know, whatever, however many months it was. And when I realised that running was super uncomfortable because of what was happening, but I didn't, hadn't yet had the diagnosis, I stopped. And I was like, I've just got to find another machine that I really love because I can't run on a treadmill. I can't run in a park and do the thing that I previously loved. So mm. how do I rework this? How do I change my mental state so that I can still find something that I love? And so I did that. Mm. And it's cool. And it keeps me focused. And, you know, it's cool. You learn so much through different things that you feel like they are challenging but uh, you feel like they're the biggest challenges at the time but then Mm. when you simmer it down the learnings are greater yeah yeah it's just a it's that process of going from being bad at something yeah to getting better at it which is like off-putting yes and that's the hardest part because you're so good at this yeah that when you go (laughs) to being crap yeah you, you have to endure this yeah. time where you're like uncomfortable or unsure yeah. if things are being done right. Correct. Yeah. It's humbling. Yeah, I've definitely learned that from jiu-jitsu because yeah. you're, you, know, you start off as a white belt where you don't know anything and you're already, you know, at, on the first class, you might roll with a professor who's like a black belt and done yeah. it for 10, 20 years. Yeah. And you get, like, obviously, they, they don't smash you, but then maybe the purple belt in the middle will because... Why not? They just, yeah, <laughs> yeah, why not? They just because you don't know anything, You're so the they'll just try. Yeah, and you and and like, I I feel like to kind of persevere through that first year takes a takes a certain person to keep going because mm. you're getting pummeled, like yeah. you're getting smashed. You're not in top position. You're not dominating anyone. You're yeah. literally getting dominated. Yeah. And if you have a problem with that, you will just quit because yeah. I don't know. You may have an insecurity or something, and, and but. Once you get past this point, and I'm, I'm still not there because I still suck. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I, I, I feel like, you know, now I might have one to two percent more success than I did when I first started. Yeah. And I'm like, that feels good. Yeah. But it's like that year of, you know, and maybe it doesn't have to be a year. You know, maybe it's just a month of training a certain way that needs to be better for you now. Yeah. But it's definitely worth it. As you said, if the learning is greater than yep. where you're at now. Yeah. Mm. And don't discount the 1% to 2% gains, right? Yeah. Like whether it's nutrition and you've made, I always say this to people, like stop trying to change everything all at once. Mm. Make one habit that you're going to stick to and do that for a period of time before trying to induce, introduce the next mm. because that's a small percentage change. But once you start doing that, like small percentage changes frequently, you'll sustain them for longer. Mm. And... You, that's successful. Yeah. That's a sign of success. But that's such an uphill battle. Like, as you're saying, we're on social media so much where everything is so polarizing and everything's mm. so extreme. Yeah. That this whole gray area of slow success, a positive trajectory that mm. will get you there in the long run. Yeah. It's just not popping up anywhere yeah. because it doesn't get rewarded. It doesn't get eyes. It doesn't get the shock value. Yeah. That's that's one thing that kind of frustrates me at the moment with yeah. like social media as I've, I guess, become more mature. Like, you know, maybe back in the day when I first started posting, I was like, yeah, that's cool because uh, I get likes and views yeah. and stuff. And now I don't care as much more about like the message of what I'm trying to say. But yeah, it's 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 just not sexy to say, hey, man, just like, you know, do one habit for a week mm. and then another habit for maybe a month. And then we'll keep adding on because yeah it's not shocking it's, it's not, not like shocking. oh i didn't know that <laughs> no <laughs> every, everyone knows that yeah right? everyone knows that if you save like ten dollars a week it's you know better than trying to save a, a grand in a week if yeah. you can and then failing and then going oh well i'm just going to spend everything because i'm just fed up and i'm a failure and all this kind of yeah. stuff and the same thing happens with nutrition the same thing happens with training you go from no training to training every day yeah you go from you know eating whatever you eat to going keto and you can't sustain yeah. it like <laughs> that's it you know like that's it's it's just a cycle that we get caught up in it's so yeah. hard um i did want to talk about one thing just before we do the final three questions uh, you talked about your eating disorder previously you know, yeah. and we don't have to spend a lot of time on it, but I've been through my own journey. I don't really know how to categorize if I had an eating disorder or not, but I yeah. I personally think I did, but then I don't want to be this person that's like, oh, feel sorry for me because I did. Um, but maybe I did, maybe I didn't, but I definitely struggled with, with 
calorie intake like you said trying to burn this to do yeah. this and i'd have a burger and then i'd do a <laughs> plank at home yeah. and <laughs> ab workout to try and burn it off yeah. and I'd, 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 I'd do everything how did you navigate through that because for me mine was not overnight no and i can't see the day where i made a change but it happened somewhere yeah um and for me, looking back at it, it was me eradicating dichotomous thinking of good and bad. Mm. And I actually had to lean into the quote unquote bad foods to actually find out the next day that I was okay yeah. and that it didn't make me fat, which I was terrified, like, well, not terrified of, but like, you know, mm. like gaining body fat. Yep. Oh, it's the worst thing in the world, <laughs> you know, back then. Oh, yeah. no, you can't do that and be a personal <laughs> yeah, trainer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no way. No one's measuring your body <laughs> fat on the daily. <laughs> yeah. So, Except you. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, you know, I would, I'd have things like ice cream and mm. cake and donuts and all that kind of stuff that's supposedly bad. But then the next day I was like, oh, I, I, I actually don't feel like a bad person. I mm. haven't gained a lot of weight that I thought it was. I, I, I don't actually feel that terrible. Not saying that that's what I, like what I recommend to people, but mm. I, like that was kind of my way through it. Like mm -hmm. accepting that I can have foods like that and it didn't make a big difference. Yeah. Um, obviously it's not the most health seeking thing to do, but it, I needed that at the time. Yeah. What helped get you through that tough period? Because I know everyone has different experiences and yep. everyone goes through that process for different reasons. Yeah. Um, similar sorts of things. So, you know, we do know that when you restrict certain foods, it only makes you crave them more. And mm. that's why people go and binge on foods as a result as well, right? When you put them in good or bad, you crave the bad and then it's uncontrollable when you're near them or the tormenting thoughts that you have around your bad foods when you're eating them is just out of control. Yeah. So when you start to just work on releasing and letting go of this um, list of restrictions and the do's and the... And like you have to do this and you can't do that and all these rules that you have around yeah. your diet and health. And this is what I mean, like you can't let go of all those rules one at a time, uh, sorry, all at once. You need to let go of them just slowly mm. over time. Like otherwise it's overwhelming and otherwise you just go back and sometimes step even further back into it than what you were when you started, which is dangerous. Um, so just letting go of those things one at a time. Like I, I do remember those months following when I was like really acknowledged that there was still an issue at play and this is like 15 years on I was like I just I don't feel like I can do this anymore like I don't think this serves me I'm not energized in the way that I feel like I want to be but yet and I don't sleep as much and I think I'm missing out on some parts of life that I think I'd really like to enjoy like friends just going out and eating pizza and pasta on a Friday night and mm -hmm. having a wine but not going home and then either purging it or starving myself for the next two days because I wanted to reduce my caloric intake so significantly to counterbalance what I'd eaten on yeah. that night. Like, I was like, if they, others, majority can seem to do that, I'm sure I can find a way that I can do that too. Um, so, you know finding good people to surround you whilst you're moving through these sorts of things is pretty important because if you're in a toxic environment with people that are perpetuating an issue, <laughs> like yeah. at a gym maybe, where lots of people are obsessing yeah. in the PT room at the back <laughs> over those sorts yeah, of things, 100%. sometimes that can be a problem. Um, and certainly women will attract what they are at a different time of life, right? That's just natural, um, and men too. But um, people attract what they are at different stages of life. So when you start to address what's around you and the noise that's getting in your ear about these things, that can be a really great step forward. And just letting go, like, slowly of these rules, like going out and having your dinner. I remember walking home one night, I was like, you know what, in this moment, I feel like a chocolate ice cream. And I was on my own and I bought myself a Magnum and I ate it and I was okay. Yeah. And I didn't go and try and beat myself up the next day for it. I just moved on and I didn't do that every night and I didn't do it every week, but like maybe once a fortnight, mm. I would go out with friends, eat dinner, have a wine and then enjoy the ice cream mm. on a walk home. Not because I was trying to hide it. We hadn't eaten dessert dinner, whatever, mm. but 
it was just that moment of going, I'm okay with this mm. and I, I will be okay and everything will be okay. And I wanted to ultimately, I think as well, that sort of marker in this time for me was I'd had Jet, my eldest, and you know, I was sort of two years in, I was a single mum, and I still sort of realised I was like, there's like some patterns here that, you know what, like, I, I don't want my son growing up observing this of me, mm. and ultimately, I don't want my daughters, go, you know, if I have more children, I don't want anyone growing up observing this of me because we are role models to our children. I want my children to see a healthy and happy mum, and to know that eating all foods is totally okay. Mm. You know, obviously I love healthy, nutritious food, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's still okay to have your magnum every mm. now and then yeah. because you're human and you need to live a life of balance, not restriction. And ultimately wanting to become the best role model for my kids put me in a position to become the best role model for myself. Yeah. Because I had to resolve that mm. for me. It wasn't mm. it was like this doesn't need to go on any longer. Like I don't need to be mucking up my body in this way any longer. Mm. There's greater joy out there than the obsession I have over the calories that are going in my body. Mm. So it's this combination of like learning and studying nutrition really intensely, having a child and trying to sort of let go of these patterns of disordered eating, which had chased me around for 15 years. Mm. It was a really intense time, but my <coughs> God, it was so worth it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because it's so liberating, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, like, it is. When you yeah. finally let go and you look back at that time, you're like, how did I even exist? Yeah, you think like, man, because like, <laughs> my wife's been through a similar thing. Yeah. Like we've found out after dating for a while that we had a pretty similar experience with food. Mm. Uh, you know, really low calorie stuff and over exercising, mm. training twice a day, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I do think for females, it can be slightly more damaging hormone wise than it is for men. Absolutely. Like, I don't know if that's 100 percent true, but from what you say, I kind of guess it is because she definitely had a more negative impact than I did. Like my energy was not so good, um, but I over power that with my mindset like mm. just work harder type yeah, thing yeah. it's crazy what your mind can do yeah but i feel like her experience uh, affected her more on a long-term basis yep. uh, with things like inflammation and swelling and her gut and, and and things like that and i feel like i didn't really experience that yeah um so we had some similarities there but yeah we looked back and we we're like man we like i can't believe that we would just think about food so much like we'd yeah. literally just think about what we're going to eat the whole day yeah and it's like you're just obsessed about it. Yeah. You know, I, I think one of the biggest compliments I ever got from, you know, as a coach from one of my clients was actually his name's Doug. He's from the uh, he's from the Northern Beaches, actually. And he and, and we I did coaching with him and his piece of advice or his kind of, I guess, testimonial type thing was that he, you know, he lost about eight kilo, seven or eight kilos in eight weeks. Yeah. And though it's not a race to lose body fat. He was turning 60, so yeah. and he wanted to sort out his triglycerides because he wasn't, you know, in cholesterol. They weren't in an unhealth, they weren't in a healthy place, and we got them in that space of time uh, to a healthy place. And he was stoked because throughout the time he was having burgers and beers, yeah, right? right? Not every night, yeah. But he thought that was just crazy. Yeah. He thought that was inconceivable. Yeah. And that's what I love about the idea of being flexible with your food is that, and I, and what works long-term because I've been that person that boils vegetables that, you know, does yeah. everything like that. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I just over, overdid it. Yes. I was like, there was no, nothing else on here except yeah. salt and pepper, like yeah. nothing else. <laughs> Not lemon? Like, no, nothing? no. <laughs> I, 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 I was like nothing. Yeah. Wow. Uh, well, first of all, I'm a terrible chef. So that that stuff could have probably worked, but I was just like <laughs> salt and pepper, like meat yeah. boiled, vegetables boiled, boiled eggs. Everything was just like in water, so it was like yeah. tasted terrible, <laughs> <laughs> and like low calorie this yeah. and that. And I was just eating pumpkin because pumpkin was thirty three calories per cup, and I could yeah. eat heaps. And my skin was going orange. Yeah. I, was like, I, I, I remember sitting there. Look, <laughs> I remember sitting there looking at my hands like, man, do I have cancer? And then I was like, I'm eating heaps of carrots and pumpkin that's yeah. why so yeah it's just it's yeah it's been a wild ride but it's crazy to think when you get through it which can be a long journey or a short journey mm. you can't believe 
how you can just sit down at a dinner or go out to dinner with friends and just leave satisfied. Yeah. Because that idea seems so crazy at the time. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And it's a wonderful thing. And, you know, you were saying before about how social media loves a shock factor. They don't necessarily want to hear about the 1% or 2% changes. But I, I guess, and maybe what you experience too, is you, you end up just attracting the people that understand your message mm. and can relate to it and will can put it into practice in that way. Like Doug, for instance, you know, yeah. you don't have to restrict and get everything out of your diet that you deemed bad food or you didn't understand what you were eating in order to lose the weight that you'd like to, to be mm. in better health. You can still have a bit of that stuff and that can be part of your lifestyle, but it doesn't need to be every day and mm. nor do you need to restrict it. Like there is a much better and balanced way than what the diets and the, you know, those fad diets and there are a lot of them out there at this time of year as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, so many. Do to people because if, you know, if diets worked, then one, you'd stay on them long term because they worked or two, you'd get the results that you want and they'd stay. But ultimately, those results generally don't hang around yeah. forever. Yeah, the data on successful diets and, yeah. and weight loss long term is not very in our favor. No. Unfortunately. So, th yeah, well, that's the battle I'm fighting and I'm sure you are too to yeah. try and make things more sustainable. Yes. Um, but yeah, once again, that shock value is not there with sustainable weight yeah. loss. <laughs> it's like, yeah, cool, man. Next. Yeah. Um, uh, let's do the final three questions. Okay. That's what we're here for a long time. Yeah. Um, but I've really enjoyed this. This has been really cool. Um, so the Better With Brock podcast, I'm quite obsessed with um, self-development. Yeah. Right. So um, I've, I've always been from a, I think it was from like deep down, I lost my mum at a young age, so I've always been very obsessed with, like, I guess, making the most of life and mm. being the best person I can. So um, that's one reason I wanted to make this podcast to kind of, I guess, help me learn more as well, but also the the listeners become better, not just only in fitness and nutrition and, you know, body transformation stuff, which is what I do for work, but ultimately just to become a better person because yep. I feel like we, you know, aren't guaranteed anything. Uh, even just to wake up the next day, you just never know. And that's not to put a shadow on life, but just, I guess, more so sunshine on life to be like, make yeah. the most of every day. Um, so these questions are just mainly around self-development and, and maybe tools that have got you there. But the first one is um, a book that has helped you become better as a person. Um, undoubtedly, uh, The Gifts of Imperfection by Brene Brown. I haven't read that. Oh, I really recommend it. Small. So, I like small yeah. books. Yeah, <laughs> no, don't you reckon? Because you can yeah. just tuck them in places, and then yeah. then you read a few pages here and there, and then you've read this book, and you feel a, like little tick of the box or yeah, another and book. Yeah, <laughs> and, it, and it doesn't like sit there like weighing. Lurking. This, yeah. yeah, like oh, I'm in a big one at the moment. I'm just I haven't touched it for a while because yeah. <laughs> I'm like it's too intimidating. It is, yeah. yeah. Um, that one for me came about at a time of my life when. It was probably in this, you know, resolve of things that I was trying to control with like eating disorders and mm. um, I was a single parent. I just launched my business. I really wanted things to be like awesome but also perfect. Yeah. And a good friend who has mentored me throughout the years said to me one day, you know, Jack, perfectionism, perfectionism is a beast. So you, you be careful of that beast, won't mm. you? Because it's not necessarily a good thing. And then I'd come across Brene Brown's work through some other means and picked up the book. And it's that book that I have marked and highlighted mm. all sorts, like everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> Everything's important here. <laughs> like, yeah. how, do I, how do I capture, like, the whole book is highlighted and marked up yeah. because it just had such an impact on me. And I won't ruin it because I really think you should read it. But letting go of perfection and just stepping into things wholeheartedly and without any other intention than just being really present and authentic at that moment without thinking of how you can make it the perfect moment or the, the perfect presentation of something. Like sometimes done is just good enough. Mm. You've done it and that's great. That steps you away from not doing it at all because you're fearful of perfect, like you won't perfect it. Yeah. So that was a really, really like, a powerful book that just landed at the right time. Mm. And I really, uh, I really take stock of that stuff. Like it's, um, 
I'm really aware of when, you know, I want something to be awesome, but also if that's holding me back from just getting it out there, then just get it out there. Like, mm. <laughs> you know, the only, the, your worst critic is yourself. Mm. So if you let go of some of those perfecting habits and just get out there and do it, you feel a whole lot better for it. Yeah, that can often just lead to kind of lack of action. If totally. you're, like I've experienced that too. I have a similar yeah. mindset where yeah. you want everything to be perfect yeah. and then it just never comes out and yeah. maybe you miss that timing business-wise where it would have popped or, yeah. or even just, yeah, say renovating a house when you're having a newborn or trying to do something. <laughs> it's like, is this, is this going to be fine yeah. for now or do we need to be crazy and stressed at this time? Yeah, um, yeah that's, that's super important. I'll, I'll definitely have to get onto that. Yeah. Second one is a quote that has helped you become a better person. Um, I found this one in my early days of being a single parent and running a business and it was um, every day you have two choices. You can stay asleep with your dreams or wake up and chase them. Mm. And I loved that one because, again, it came, like, I guess the perfectionism and, you know, just getting out there and doing it and not overthinking it was really powerful for me. It's like, you know, I have all these great dreams and you can sit and you can keep dreaming about them or you can just go out and take one step that day towards realizing them and maybe sometimes they won't be what you had hoped they would be but at least you gave it a crack like Mm. at least you got out of bed at least you made that call did that podcast connected with that person went and put yourself out there in whatever way took that first client on because you wanted to start your business in nutrition Mm. whatever it was but at least you gave it a crack yeah you know you didn't sit with it because I guess the biggest thing with people not realizing their dreams and what they want from life is that it's, you know, you have to step out of a comfort zone Mm. and that can be scary. And, you know, things may not work out and then you might think you're a failure, but you're actually not (laughs) like, yeah, you're really not. And what's that other great quote? Like the master has failed more times than the student has tried. Yeah. I love that. I've my, never heard that. Yeah, nice my yeah. meditation teacher taught me that years ago, Jackie Lewis at the Broad Place. And that was awesome too. It's like just it's okay to fail. Yeah. Because you've just got to pick yourself up. And the more fails you have, the better you are at actually getting yourself up again. Yeah. Like, you know. Mm. So mm. they've been really powerful in my journey, in my journey in business, um, in my journey in motherhood as a daughter, as a friend, like Mm. they're probably the two that have hit heart the most. I I think that's one thing my dad had installed in me like Mm. at at, at, at quite a young age, like, because he's so supportive of everything and just everything is just give it a go. Yeah. I I played like six sports growing up because it was like, just give it a go. Yeah. And then that kind of panned out into my attitude as I got older where I just tried everything. Yeah. Like I want, so previously, before I was a personal trainer, I was a singer, right? Really? Yeah, I, I was a singer. So Do you uh, close a podcast with a few tunes? <laughs> yeah, I probably should. <laughs> Can you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I probably should, but yeah, Keep my dad... Keep listening. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I, I, um, I sang to her at our wedding. Oh, I, I, um, I love that. I, I wrote a song for her. So I don't really sing anymore, but like yeah. I, I just joke around. Like I, I, awesome. just, I just sing to my wife. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I did that. Like I, I literally tried everything. I tried, I did TV presenting for a while. Yeah. I did, um, you know, music, I did sport, not at a professional level because I chose the wrong sport that wasn't professional, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but at a high level where at any other sport you probably would get paid. Yeah. But like, yeah. <laughs> what was just it? The, uh, I played touch rugby. Okay. Right? No, yeah. you don't hear about touch rugby Exactly. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, hopefully this goes professional. Yeah. And then I got asked to play for New Zealand and then they were like, oh, but it costs like, you know x amount of grand and i was yeah. a student so i was like well that's me i'm out yeah. <laughs> so but yeah my dad was always very encouraging yeah. like and maybe i wasn't the best at this or that but i just tried mm. and that's like i feel like what i've learned is just like perseverance like you just yeah. try so many times that eventually yeah. <laughs> hopefully something yeah. works out and usually it does because even the things that you failed on you've like learned something out of yeah. that failure you know like you try this and all these 10 attempts that you've had, you've learned something that may not even be specific to what you're trying to achieve, but they're yeah. kind of life lessons that you, you know, put in your bag and take for the rest of your life. Yeah, so. it's so true. Yeah. And even my son said that to me um, when I was able to surf a couple of years ago and I'm looking forward to getting back on the surfboard once my hips are done. But 
Um, we were out in the surf and he's a great surfer. Yeah. Um, and he was a little whippersnapper then, like 10 years old. And I was out there and he was just like getting wave after wave after wave. And I was just getting smashed. <laughs> and I went to go. I was like, I just don't think I can do another wave. I'm going to get smashed. He's like, mum, you're always going to get smashed. But you'll always pop up. I was like, okay, cool. Well, thanks for teaching me that lesson that yeah. I've taught you. And now it's coming back at me. And I really love that. Like, you're going to get smashed. Yeah. Undoubtedly. But at least you're, you know, having a go. Yeah. That's, That's most so important. Good. Yeah. Last question. Um, one thing you do every day that helps you become better. I move my body. Yeah. <laughs> I move my body every day. I get out of the house mostly first thing in the morning to get some fresh air, to connect with other people because certainly being and running a business from home and also um, running a family, a big family as well. Um, there's a lot of home time if you don't get out of the house first yeah. thing. Um, and I'm really aware of that and the impact that not getting out and moving has on my mental health. Yeah. Um, aside from this unique time in January, you know, it's walking, it's yoga in very gentle way now. Um, it's swimming. I love ocean swimming. I love pool swimming. I've really gotten back into all of that. Um, I love moving with my kids in whatever way I possibly can down mm. at the beach. And that's really important to me. I really want to, you know, I want that to be our lifestyle and for them to feel like that makes them a better person too. Mm. You get out there and you just enjoy life, move, get to know people. Like there's so much that you can do through movement, right? Like you mm. meet people, you bump into people, you throw balls at people's heads by accident. It's like awkward, but at yeah. least you can have a chat. All sorts of things happen when you're out there and mm. ultimately you just you feel better for you about yourself and for yourself and you're making the most of life mm. and the body that you're so privileged to live in. Mm. Awesome. Well, we better wrap it up there. Yeah. Um, where can people find you or where do you want to send people? Um, obviously, you have the two different businesses. Yeah. So. <laughs> Very confusing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so you will find me at Brown Paper Nutrition and at Day One Fertility. Yeah. So two different places offering hopefully – an abundance of things that you can get your hands on and learn from and enjoy um, and take with you in whatever is ahead of you. Mm, awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks I for think having me. Uh, I think it's super important for people like yourself to be in the industry that are focused on sustained success and things that are founded in evidence and founded in things that work like science. And yeah. You know, not just anecdote. Even though that is important, um, I think it's important to mix it with uh, things that are actually trusted. Because, yeah. uh, man, like even just being on TikTok and stuff like that, the things that are big and go wild are just mm. like... The, it can frustrate you if you... Well, it definitely frustrates me because I'm like, why is this going crazy yeah. when it literally doesn't mean anything or yeah. doesn't stand on anything certain yeah. that is can be successful so yeah. yeah keep doing what you're doing thank um, you i, I wish you nothing that. but the best and it's been awesome to catch up yeah, yeah. <laughs> look forward to seeing your new baby arrive yeah, me it's too. so exciting yeah. i might have to land a little brown paper bag of goodness oh, on your nice. doorstep yeah. <laughs> you said you're not a great cook i've Terrible. taken that on board i do know what mothers and new families need <laughs> when they've just had a baby so i'll um i'll organize a little delivery to your oh, doorstep awesome all right <laughs> thanks for coming on. my absolute pleasure cheers